Hi everyone, and welcome to Group 4's presentation, Minimal Objects, Minimalism, and Post-Minimalism, by Hannah Quinn, Jacqueline Satimio, and Karina Tomlinson. Here is a look at the readings we will be covering in this presentation. These are the main discussion questions that we will be considering this week. Here is a list of vocabulary terms we felt would be most helpful for you. Introduction. In this presentation, we will explore the ways in which minimalism broke the mold of modernist sculpture in its use of material and engagement with the viewer through the works of artists Donald Judd, Sol LeWitt, Dan Flavin, Carl Andre, and Robert Morris. We will examine the criticism of Michael Fried and his article against Morris and the Minimalist. Final, finally, we will take a look at the way in which post-minimalism and Morris's anti-form evolved through an increasing focus on process stemming from minimalism's breakdown of the boundary between the viewer and the artwork. Greenberg's Modernism. Our readings this week begin with a recap of Greenberg's ideas of modernism from his 1949 article, The New Sculpture, in which he states that sculpture, not painting, would best represent the future of art. He claimed that the concreteness and literalness of the medium that had once been its weakness was now its strong point. He asserted that sculpture would affect the viewer optically and instead of physically and used David Smith as his prime example. Later on in 1956, he revised his ideas and condemned sculpture for its artiness. Britain's New Generation. In the late 1950s at St. Martin's School of Art, where Corot had become a, a teacher, a group of young sculptors came together and became known as the New Generation. This group rejected traditional materials and methods of carving or modeling in favor of fiberglass, plastics, and new forms of construction. They no longer used bases or pedestals and set their sculptures on the ground in direct relation to the viewer's space. They also avoided monumentality in favor of exploring their sculptures in relation to human scale. Lastly, they preferred strong colors and modern materials and, process, and processes associated with design and manufacturing. While the work of the new generation and the work of American minimalists share a resistance to tricks in their sculptures, when shown next to each other in the 1966 show Primary St Structures, Critics favored minimalism for its directness and simplicity. Seemingly aware of Greenberg's request, David Smith continued to create clean, simple sculptures throughout the 1960s. His work was concerned with a frank and uncomplicated relationship with the spectator. His art is accessible in the sense that there is nothing hidden, yet it does not depart from established languages of art to the extent that minimalism does. While it seems counterintuitive to talk about the human figure in relation to such an abstract piece, this becomes an increasingly important topic when the base or the pedestal is eliminated and the sculpture suddenly is in the same plane as ours. The catalyst for this change was minimalism. In 1966, with the exhibition's Primary Structures and Systematic Painting, Minimalism began. Minimalism was an art movement that was preoccupied with symmetry and modern materials and stressed the outside surface of an object. Most often, they eliminated the base so that the, scul so that the sculpture rested directly on the ground. From at least one point of view, the viewer could see the whole form of the object at once. They rejected the restlessness of 1950s informal art and the active surface of previous bronzes. They placed an emphasis on size and scale, especially in relation to the human body. Lastly, they refused to fetishize the role of the artist, drawing from constructivist terminology. 
Influences. Minimalism was American, with specific ties to the artist of the East Coast. The desire to turn away from the European preoccupation with composition. The minimalist, especially Robert Morris, rejected Cubism for its relation to composition, and in so doing made a declaration of independence from the European-driven notions of modernism. That being said, minimalism was indebted to the groundwork laid by the nouveau re realist, pop art, and Marcel Duchamp, because these movements shifted the center of sculpture from the internal to the external content. Similarly, they were influenced by the work of Constantin Brancusch for his concentration on the surface of his work. Lastly, they were interested in the ideas of the Russian constructivist, such as Vladimir Totlin, for his for their contribution of manufacturing and daily life. One of the most prominent minimalist sculptors was Donald Judd. He had a Midwest upbringing, which he retained a sentiment for. He was interested in and divided on architecture and art originally, but eventually chose art. However, he also discovered a deep connection with philosophy. He derived ideas the same way many of his peers, such as Stella did, from one another. He was often at odds with the world around him, especially about how the world treated art, typically through display. This and his interest in architecture made him very critical of the world around him, fostering his concern for the manipulation of space. In his article, Specific Objects, Judd says that there is a new type of art. It is no longer sculpture or painting, and despite being similar or different to these two ways of making, three-dimensional work, or new work, was its own entity. The new work that exists now is coined as three-dimensional work because it is similar as we can make these works. They are broad, undeniable, and modern in its truest sense. They created their own sense of what art was becoming. No longer was there enough in these works to attribute to either painting or sculpture. They must be something new. Works such as these need only be interesting in order to prevail a purpose to the world. Three-dimensional work offered the viewer a complete sense of wholeness to a work of art. Three-dimensional work does not negate the fact that a painting is actually a rectangle, but embraces the whole of its parts rather than the sum of the illusionist elements traditional work provided prior. When a person is presented with a Judd artwork, it is not expected for them to just understand it. It is a type of work that allows the viewer to wander around and experience the work through color and material. His work was about offering possibilities to the viewer, about offering us the chance to find our own way through the art. While Judd, Judd may not be clear about what someone is to find in his work, he was clear in what he left out, illusionism and past sculptural ways. The longer you look at it, the more you will find. In both this work and the pieces on the previous slide, we can see the way in which Judd became preoccupied with the shape of the box and began stacking it repeatedly, both vertically and horizontally. These boxes had plexiglass tops that reflected the room around them. While some have suggested that this obsession with boxes was an attempt to find an ideal form, Judd was not an idealist and was instead focused on various forms of perception in different ways to portray physical facts. Similar to Judd, Sol LeWitt began to create open sculptures out of a repeating cube structure. He claimed that the work was intuitive and that while it was based on an internal concept, he was not trying to tap into any sort of transcendental element. Dan Flavin is another minimalist who experimented with new materials, specifically neon tubes. Often installed in groups, his sculptures call attention to the shape and the size of the room itself. As many minimalists were, Flavin was interested in Russian constructivism, and in this piece pays tribute to Vladimir Totlin's interest in non-sculptural materials and sculpture's relationship to architecture and the everyday world. Furthermore, this piece continues the minimalist interest in grounding a work to the floor 
even when hung on the wall, and in this way, directly engaging with the viewer's space. Here is another more colorful example of Dan Flavin's exploration of light, space, and architecture in the Menil Collection in Houston, Texas. The minimalist continued to push the viewer relationship to their art. When asked about why he, Tony Smith, had not made his life height cubicle sculpture die, 1962, larger, he replied that he was not making a monument. Asked why he had not made it smaller so that one could see over the top, Smith answered that he was not making an object. It is in this middle ground that a person most effectively relates to the presence, equating it to a human figure. Carl Andre continues to push the boundaries between the viewer and the art. In his equivalence, one through eight, he places the bricks directly on the floor and asks the viewer to maneuver around them in the space. Taking this idea even further, in his piece, Steel Magnesium Plane, he invites the viewer to step directly on the work itself, completely breaking the division between the viewer and the artwork. Lastly, Andre's Equivalence series embodies Morris's idea of gestalt, or the idea of being able to take in a form all at once because of its simplicity. This is because, whether stacked or disassembled, the bricks have the same immediate, natural, naturally comprehensible impression, or gestalt. Another minimalist concerned with the relationship between the viewer and his art was Robert Morris, who is both an artist and a writer. In his Notes on Sculpture, Part 1 and 2, from the February 1966 Art Forum edition, um, Morris described how he felt that minimalist sculpture was being weakened by the use of the highly decorative, the precious, and the gigantic. He found these qualities not to be relevant experiences for sculpture, for they, um, for they unbalance balance complex plastic relationships, causing one to focus on these qualities. Morris spoke of the gestalt of view viewing a simpler rectangular polyhedrons. He explained that complex irregular polyhedrons allow for the divisibility of parts insofar as they create weak gestalts. Morris rejected the relief and felt that the sculpture demands that it have its own equally literal space, not a surface shared with painting, as one of the conditions of knowing an object is supplied by the sensing of the gravitational force acting upon it in actual space. Color was also problematic to Morris, as he felt it could subvert the physical due to its emphasis on the optical. Light surrounding or hitting the sculpture was, a, was an important component, just as the space around the object. This piece explores this idea in an interesting way as the mirrored surfaces reflect and create a dynamic relationship between the viewer and the object itself. Morris felt that it was important to take note of the fact that things smaller than ourselves are seen differently than things larger. The quality of intimacy is attached to an object in a fairly direct proportion as its size diminishes in relation to oneself. The quality of publicness is attached in proportion as the size increases in relation to oneself. This holds true as long as one is regarding the whole of a large thing and not a part. In this work, we see Morris attempting to take all focus away from the color of the L-beams and shift it all, all the attention to the form and the size of the three identical pieces positioned on the floor in the viewer's space. The awareness of scale is a function of the comparison between that constant, one's body size, and the object, and in this sense, space does not exist for intimate objects. It is necessary literally to keep one's distance from large objects in order to take the, ho the whole of any view into one's field of vision. It is this necessary greater distance of the object in space from our bodies in order that it be seen at all, that structures the non-personal or the public mode.
In his 1967 article, Art and Objecthood, the avid critic Michael Fried responded to Morris's ideas and voiced his rejection of the minimalist, who he names the literalist. He states that the literalist espousal of objecthood amounts to nothing other than a plea for a new genre of theater, and theater is now the negation of art. Literalist sensibility is theatrical because, to begin with, it is concerned with the actual circumstances in which the beholder encounters literalist work. He takes particular offense to Morris's connection between the size of a piece and their experience of it as either a private or public work. He states that the, the theatricality of Morris's notion of the non-personal or public mode seems obvious. The largeness of the piece in conjunction with its non-relational unitary character distances the beholder, not just physically, but psychically. It is in, it is, one might say, Precisely this distancing that makes the beholder a subject and the piece in question an object. But it does not follow that the larger the piece, the more securely its public character is established. On the contrary, beyond a certain size, the object can overwhelm and the gigantic scale becomes the loaded term. Post-minimalism and anti-form. In the late 1960s and into the 70s, we begin to see a shift in the art world. No longer are sculptures plain and made out of one material. Suddenly, all materials, including the human body, were fair game, and they brought along their historical and cultural implications. No longer was the finished piece the end goal. The process and the journey along the way became just as important as the final product. New forms of exhibition. Along with these new materials and forms came the question of how to exhibit them. Similar to the end of the 1950s, the end of the 1960s saw a shift from object-based art to more artist-driven performances. This posed a problem for the system in place because when there is no final object to sell, neither the gallery nor the artist can make a livelihood. While the traditional flow of artwork from studio to dealer to patron has never been complete, completely overthrown, during this time, new kinds of exhibiting spaces and curators emerged. As museums began to accept this new form of art, artists began creating pieces that questioned the visitor's passive consumption of the art and attempted to engage their physical presence in new ways. Now the context in which the art was seen was just as important as any type of style development. We can see the way that this type of dynamic played out in Robert Morris's continuous project Altered Daily, in which he would come in and arrange various elements every day. At the end of the exhibition, all of the material he used was disposed of. In the April 1968 edition of Art Forum, Robert Morris printed Antiform, his new take on sculpture. In this article, he introduced art process art and how it compares to minimalism or object art. Morris argued that object art was highly focused on the geometric and predominantly rectangular. The engagement of the work becomes focused on the particularization of these general forms by means of varying scale, material, proportion, and placement. The process of making itself has hardly been examined. Morris felt that, the, that of the abstract expressionist, only Pollock was able to recover process and hold on to it as part of the end form of the work, profoundly rethinking the role of both material and tools in making. Morris described how in the 19th century, both Rodin and Rousseau left traces of touch in their finished work. Like the abstract expressionist after them, they registered the plasticity of material and autobi autobiographical terms. It remained for pa Pollock and Lewis to go beyond the personalism of the hand and to, to, and to the more direct revelation of matter itself. In introducing his new idea of process art, 
he explained that recently materials other than rigid industrial ones have begun to show up, and a direct investigation of the properties of these materials is in progress. This involves a reconsideration of the use of tools in relation to material. Sometimes a direct manipulation of a given material without the use of any tool is made. In these cases, considerations of gravity become as important as those of space. Considerations of ordering are necessarily casual and imprecise and unemphasized. Random piling, loose stacking, hanging, um, give passing form to the material. Chance is accepted and indeterminacy is implied since replacing will result in another configuration. In both this example and the one on the previous slide, we can see the way in which the process of piling or the process of gravity acts on the felt of Morris's work. Compared to his rigid minimalist pieces, one can see the way in which process plays a larger role in his expression of antiform. Richard Serra was another artist for whom process outweighed the final product. In this piece, Splashing, we can see the way in which he threw molten lead into the seam between the wall and the floor of Leo Castelli's warehouse for Morris's exhibition, Nine at Leo Castelli. This exhibition blurred the line between the artist's studio and the gallery by presenting work to the public that either was site-specific, like Sarah's piece, or which resulted in no end piece. Eccentric Abstraction was another New York exhibition organized in 1966 at the Fishbach Gallery by Lucy Lepard, and was the first exhibition to challenge minimalism. Many upcoming artists showed there, including Louise Bourgeois, Bruce Nauman, and Eva Hess. German-born American Eva Hess made work in a far range of materials. Her work was craft-based, rejecting the machine aesthetic, and often was more about the transformative process than the final work. In this work, shortly before her death, we can see a connection between the wall and the floor as the latex or resin-covered cord reaches into the viewer's space. Often her work is described as mummification or funerary. Here are two additional examples of Hesse's use of latex and resin in her sculptures. Summary. Through this presentation, we have explored the way in which minimalism rebelled against formalist sculpture through their focus on modern materials and direct engagement with the space of the viewer. To do this, they did away with the pedestal and placed the object on the ground, breaking the disconnect between the viewer and the object. Furthermore, they played with size and scale as a way to relate directly with the proportions of the viewer. While critics like Freed admonished them for their theatricality and engagement with their audience, artists like Judd and Morris carried on. Ultimately, we saw a shift in the late 1960s and 70s towards post-minimalism in Morris's idea of anti-form, in which the process has become more important than the final product. These works indicate an evolution in the forms of exhibitions available to artists. Thank you for listening to Group 4's presentation. We hope it was informative and enjoyable. Have a nice day.